Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. I don't think you could ask anybody and get a no answer to this question. Uh, do you not like music? Everybody loves music. It's There's just something about it that's personal. There's a connection. And it's also, as I've learned over the past number of weeks, therapeutic. And we're going to we're going to riff on that, pun intended, a little bit longer with uh, two gentlemen, starting with one who has the president of a great organization called Baltic Street into Action, which takes that music into action in helping people in all different situations improve their lives through music. And I just realized that today we're talking about music here and the arts therapy. Peter, J Peter Jampel joins us. And I realized in your last name, Jam. It's there, music. <laughs> no, I never picked up on that. Hey, Peter. Well, it's about time you did, Steve. Uh, definitely, Peter, there's a jam and the jam pal. Love um, it. Great to be here with you. And I'm so pleased to be able to present a uh, longtime colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Ken Agan. Um, Ken is the director of the music therapy program at New York University. I could go on and on. He has uh, done many things, both in uh, clinically, uh, in terms of his professional association work, his research. Um, today, what I'd like to focus on is Ken's um, background uh, as a clinician and as a researcher in the Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy Center at NYU, his extensive knowledge and experience in working with people with autism in music. And in particular, Ken um, has evolved a, a belief in the particular special, inherent, intrinsic qualities of music that cannot be replicated in other forms of expression. That music has particular properties that um, engage us in ways both socially and neurologically that only music can. Um, so with that as a preamble, thank you, Ken, and welcome to the show. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Um, of course, talking about music therapy and its connections to the use of music and the way people relate to music outside therapy is something I'm very committed to. Um, it It's something that connects people because rather than the idea that um, people who are disabled get music therapy and everybody else just gets music, a lot of my work has been devoted towards breaking down that barrier and examining how um, folks with challenges or disabilities get the same things from music that we all do. The therapy comes from uh, the fact that they have a hard time creating the conditions for that engagement on their own. And so what the music therapist's art is to help bring the intrinsic benefits of music to people for whatever reason, whether it's cognitive, uh, motoric, emotional, or socioeconomic, can't create the engagement on their own. So uh, perhaps a, a, a way of approaching the work and um, understanding how it works and what it, uh, how the impact is experienced by um, uh, people who receive uh, music therapy services. Um, Ken, you're a working musician. You've been working in uh, a, a Grateful Dead tribute band, the Stella Blues Band for many years as a keyboard player. And I, I think having experienced uh, the long-term involvement in working in music as a working musician, has created a context where you will experience music yourself in your own life in a way that 
helps inform you about the ways in which your work with other people is reflected in your own experience. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, if you talk to people who decide to become music therapists, um, they'll all say a combination of, well, they love music, it means a great deal to them, and they want to help people. But if you think about it, every single music therapist had experience with music itself before they became a music therapist. So their desire to become a music therapist is rooted in just their non-clinical universal experience and engagement with music. Um, for me, I'd have to go back to my um, early, early years in the mid and late 70s and being part of the Grateful Dead audience and feeling certain qualities of experience that I felt nowhere else. There was a way in which <clears throat> those concerts and those uh, time periods brought people together, brought the audience into the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, into the present moment, and created uh, moments, experiences of healing within the context of a very special shared camaraderie. This camaraderie was among the audience members and between the audience and the band. So I had these experiences of, gosh, this is one of the most, if not the most powerful experiences I've ever had as a human being. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful ways of connecting with other people. I think when people connect in music, um, well, listen, there are all types of connections. People on a sports team feel connection. People on an, in a nonprofit agency feel a connection to a mission. People in a religion feel a connection. But I think when people connect through music, it's unlike any other type of connection. And so my decision to become a music therapist, I think was rooted in those early experiences. Um, and, you know, I think the problem is for a lot of music therapists, the need to explain their work in clinical, medical, scientific language makes them forget why they originally got into the field. They become the extrinsic rationale, which they use for pragmatic purposes. And something I promised myself was never to forget the origins, mm. that what I hope to bring my clients was rooted in what I experienced in my early 20s in those contexts. Ken, has anything changed? Because I, I feel what, what you're describing and I will go to any live performance, anywhere, any genre, doesn't matter. I get judged from friends, like, you're going to see that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and it's not even just about the music. It's about the connection. There's an energy. It's electric. There's just something being in a venue, whether it's 100 people watching somebody play guitar or a concert venue with 8,000, 14,000 people. There's just something like you described, that collective connection. Has anything changed or what has changed from back in the day, you know, when you started talking about when you were in your 20s experiencing uh, sure. music? Well, a couple of things. First, you know, that special camaraderie, the musical communitas we all feel together, exists in many um, genres of music, not just in Grateful Dead or jam band music. It's as present in forms of heavy metal hip hop, um, rave, EDM music. So it's not a specific, it's not specific to one genre or group. Um, I think one of the problems in, um, in this now is that recorded music has become so perfected mm. because of the way that digital technology can be used to um, eliminate the imperfections in music. Music from the, the pre-digital age had imperfections. A guitar string stretched out. A vocalist was perhaps not precisely on the specific millimeter of pitch. Now, these things, what ethnomusicologists call participatory discrepancies, um, these are actually not, these imperfections are what music makes music feel real. 
what makes it feel human mm -hmm. we are invited mm -hmm. we feel invited into music because it's imperfect yep it's a reflection of our humanity so what i fear happening is um people who don't experience live music are expecting it to sound like it does on the recording and i i fear that the whole essence of music could possibly be lost through its so-called perfection through the use of di digital technology. However, again, uh, uh, using my own experience as a musician in a Grateful Dead tribute band, I look in our audience, there are as many people in their 20s as there yeah. are in their 60s, which says to me, there's an intrinsic essential human need to experience humanity through music with other people and yeah. people get that once they're exposed to it but again my fear is that it will be lost i i, I by the way uh i've i'm also a disc jockey have played music on the radio since i was 17 <laughs> paid professionally so you know music geek here um and it's funny you talk about jam bands over the weekend i got together with uh, a friend co-worker and he invited some of his friends over and and their thing is jam bands they go to concerts and and i'm sitting there on the couch and we're watching youtube and they're they're playing a band called lettuce i don't know if you've heard of them sure sure and then we're we're like bouncing back and forth i'm like oh yeah you like that and then i'm like yeah what about the brecker brothers they came out in the 70s there's so many great songs that they did and we're all all from different ages walks of life and we're all converging on this one jam band theme and it was magical bring it up on youtube let's hear it yeah. it it connects people um let's talk about the connection of music and therapy for people with autism which is something it's I, your specialty i would say yeah I, i've worked with autistic folks since um boy uh way back 1980 or so um and, you know, there's something very interesting. So I was a psychology and philosophy major in undergrad school, University of Wisconsin. And I did what you can really do with a psychology and philosophy undergraduate degree. I went and played in a rock band for two years because there was <laughs> nothing else I was really qualified to do with those two degrees. But, um, you know, studying psychology in the mid 70s, we read about autistic people. They were supposed to be cold, emotionless, mm. almost like automatons, you know, without any humanity. Um, then a few years later, uh, when I was a student at New York University, I started working with um, autistic children. They had a sense of humor. Some of them liked being hugged. Some of them liked laughing. They had some of the qualities we read about in the books, but I was like, Either these books are wrong mm -hmm. or these kids are not autistic. And it it just, uh, the thing before talking about autistic folks, I just want to acknowledge how in the last um, 40 years has been a complete sea change where now autism is seen as a form of neurodiversity. It's, it's the reason we talk about spectrum is that there's a whole spectrum of human functioning and autistic folks exist on one end of that spectrum. And um, there's no, uh, we don't have a right to ask someone to become less autistic any more than we'd have a right to uh, take someone who's gay to be less gay. Now, homosexuality used to be a diagnosis mm. um, in the diagnostic and statistical manual. So it was a reason that someone needed therapy. But the world has changed and in a much more benevolent turn accepts diversity. So with autistic folks, um, I, you know, I recently did a research study where I interviewed 29 autistic adults about uh, their lifelong relationship to music, uh, how they used music as a health resource, what it meant to them. Now, obviously, I'm dealing with a subset of autistic folks, those who are verbal and comfortable speaking. So we can't generalize everything I found there, but it, they do speak for autist, a large proportion of autistic people. And so one of the main findings of this study was autistic folks get the same thing from music that everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And it's one way 
in which their connection to other people can be forged. Now, they have learned to use music in many ways to overcome their challenges, but the idea is that the world of an autistic person is quite different from the world of a neurotypical person. They experience their senses act in a much different way. And so what music does is create almost like a virtual reality in which people from very different experiential realms can meet in the overlap. And I, there are many different ways of, of doing music therapy, many different benefits of it. But if I were just to summarize in a sentence, hey, why, why music therapy for autistic folks? It's because it creates, there's a musical world in which people from very different um, experiential worlds can meet. And, you know, of the, those 29 people that you interviewed, there is a subset of those people who perform music. And um, I think, you know, we all are musical creatures. And for those of us who see music as an essential core aspect of who we are, whether we perform or just listen and love it, um, I, I think we can all connect on that. But performers um, are engaged in aspects of music making that are also um, particular to the experience of being a working musician and connecting as a musician to others. Um, I, I, I hope, can you speak to what um, those people who are performing music, um, how it works for them, um, and, and perhaps give an example of how being a performer uh, engages people in, in a very special way. Sure. Um, you know, I think sometimes the word performance um, has a negative connotation as if someone's engaged in um, a role that's not them or not human. But there's also another sense in that word in that as human beings, we perform our identity in the world. And we try on ways of being that might otherwise be a little bit difficult for us. Um, I can tell you a little bit um, about a man, and the people in my study agreed uh, not to to not to be anonymous, so I can use his name. Uh, his name is Jonathan Chase. He's a 36-year-old man, lives alone in Portland, Oregon, and he's a professional musician. He's an electric bass player. Um, he's a high school dropout. He got a GED. I'll tell you a little about him. He studied with Victor Wooten, uh, you know, a world-class bass player, um, one of the best in the world, actually. But he was diagnosed at um, age 14, and his parents were given a really dire outlook about um, what he would be capable of, right? Um, and what Jonathan said is that um, they put him through all these tests. One of them was a motor skills test, which he failed. It was a tapping test with his fingers. And so they were telling his parents, um, you know, about what autism would mean for him. They said, he'll never drive. He'll never live alone. He'll never have meaningful relationships. He'll never have a career. And his manual dexterity is so poor, he'll never work with his hands. Now, Jonathan is a world-class electric bass player. Mm -hmm. um, and his music career, um, has given him a platform where he's also become an activist and a teacher coach for other autistic people. He's given TED Talks. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing that he told me about in our interview. Actually, I'm going to quote him if it's okay. I'm sure uh, I, you know, I hate the idea that I'm always the, the bridge through which my participants speak. And sometimes I like to give you their words. Here's what Jonathan said about performing. When you get on stage, you put on a mask. I think in most live performance, whether it's theater or drama or comedy or even public speaking, most of the time when you're in front of a group of people, you're not really your true self. You have to put up some sort of barrier between you and them. 
So I started off with music where I felt like if I put this on, if I put this thing around my neck, this piece of wood, this bass guitar, I'm not me anymore. You can't be introverted on stage. You can't be shy when you're playing in a dance band. So I got to be someone else. And I liked that. Mm -hmm. So the whole point was because he's acting the role of a performer, he acquired the confidence that inheres in that role. And then, you know, what he talks about is every skill that he learned in life, every way that he learned to be different came through music. Everything wow. he's done that's really positive. You know, he talks about how he could never have the courage to go and walk up to a girl, you know, and start talking to her. But it, he could, with that bass, start playing Brick House by Parliament and get that girl up and moving. That was his way of inviting a connection um, with someone from the opposite sex. Musicians always get the girls. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Parliament, <laughs> Parliament. Oh, we were talking about that the other night, tear the roof off the sucker. <laughs> <laughs> what a great song. Um, we're almost out of time. I really, really want to ask this question. So I guess we'll laser it. <laughs> Can do people with autism overall hear music the way we hear it? Well, um, there are people who are do starting to do research in this area. Um, and I would say I like the phrase, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, which really translates into um, autistic people as a class are just as heterogeneous as neurotypical people. Having said that, I will say that um, many of the people I interviewed talked about having um, synesthesia, where the music and tone would be associated yeah. with colors and so um, now no, um, neurotypical people have that experience as well. So what I would say is that um, unless you can get in someone else's mind, you don't know if they're hearing something the sure. same way you or I are. But um, I think one thing we're exploring and that people are doing research into is, is there an autistic way of hearing? My sense is that there is a way of hearing music that characterizes some autistic people that's related to their autism, but it's not necessarily universal in that group of individuals. Gotcha. Uh, fascinating. Peter, uh, want to wrap things up? Yeah. So Ken, um, you know, I, I think we've gotten a glimpse into uh, the most current way of thinking about people with autism um, and that in many ways, you know, we're all uh, human beings who experience music together, which is the essential feature of music making that uh, creates authentic connections that are um, simply human. Um, and say for the uh, listening audience, how people can find out more about you, your work, and um, connect with you? Sure. Well, I work at New York University. Um, I'm very easy to find by email. Just Google New York University and music therapy, um, and my name and contact information will appear. Uh, so um, I, I think that's the easiest way. Uh, there's also an American Music Therapy Association for people who just want to find out more about the field in general, and they're at musictherapy.org. Wonderful talking with both of you today. Learn so much. Uh, and Ken, you just have a way of making it easy to understand and relatable to all of us. Uh, final, final, final question. Best ever Grateful Dead song. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Come on, I can't answer <laughs> that. Um, you can ask me what I love playing. Okay. You know, well, you know how they're, listen, for the lyrics, Broke Down Palace, um, that song, uh, and the song Comes a Time. It has some of the most beautiful lines. You can't separate the music from the lyrics. Comes a Time now is, uh, I'm not familiar with that. 
song from the grateful dead lyrics however i am familiar with comes a time by neil young there's no connection right no connection okay whatsoever Um, got it and to play the song scarlet begonias Mm. uh, it's just one of my favorites so gotcha yeah love it all uh thank you both for being here today truly appreciate it okay thanks for the care thank you we'll be right back here Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, online radio box, and simple radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.